Moving on to the research portion of our show. Thank you very much. Hi, welcome to the research portion of our show. And with us is Ralph Turciano. And thank you for that intro. Well, the long running saga, uh, what appears to be more of a script line out of an Austin Powers Dr. Evil bit, the promotion of high fructose corn syrup in order to dominate the US population, therefore rule the world, is still being promoted pretty heavily. But what we noticed today is the data that came out of high fructose corn syrup. What they discovered, and this was from the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition. So this is just not some nobody. And what they said is this. A calorie, is a calorie a calorie? Or are they all created equal? Based on this study, we would say not. What is wrong with high fructose corn syrup now? Well, if you're still consuming it because you have that unbearable sweet tooth, which somehow thinks that high fructose corn syrup is somehow much, much better for you than sugar, this may change your mind. What they looked at was this. First, they did a study on high fructose corn syrup and monkeys. Of course, monkeys got to eat basically high fructose corn syrup corn syrup over seven years compared to a controlled group of monkeys who just basically ate a regular low-fat diet. When both they consumed the same amount of calories. What they discovered was this. Those who ate high fructose corn syrup gained 50% more weight than the control group because remember high fructose corn syrup makes the fat cells bigger. Therefore you could store more. They developed diabetes at three times the rate of the control group meaning you get the advantage of added benefit of missing a limb or two after a shorter period of time. And also developed hepatitis stasosis, or non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. How many of you have been to a doctor, and basically the doctor says you have non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, or you have a fatty liver, and asks you whether you've been drinking or not? Well, maybe not drinking, maybe you're consuming a little bit too many Krispy Kreme donuts. All right, what they said also too. They looked at this and they said, hey, let's back this up. Let's do a short-term study on high fructose corn syrup because we noticed that it does liver damage. We really want to know how that works. So they did a six-week trial. And this is what they discovered in high fructose corn syrup in six weeks. And they did a controlled group at the same time. All right, they discovered that high fructose corn syrup has an unusual insidious effect of not altering the bacteria in the gut but causing bacteria in the gut to migrate to the liver. And they said, the researchers measured the biomarkers of liver damage to blood samples and examined what type of bacteria was in the intestine due to fecal samples and intestinal biopsies. What surprised us most was how quickly the liver was affected and how extensive the damage was, especially without weight gain. It says, six weeks in monkeys is roughly about the equivalent to three months to humans. What that means is three months of high fructose corn syrup consumption where it's at least 24% of your calories, you're developing liver damage. Just three months. How many kids are brought up on high fructose corn syrup? And this is just the start. In the high fructose corn syrup group, the researchers found that the intestinal bacteria hadn't changed, but they were migrating to the liver and more rapidly and causing damage there. It appears that something about high fructose levels was causing the intestines to be less productive, meaning cause the intestinal tracts to basically ulcerate and erode, allowing other things to go places where they don't normally belong, like undigested food and the like. Less protective than normal because of the erosion of the intestinal tract, and consequently allowing the bacteria to leak out at a 30% higher rate. So the research conclude that high fructose corn syrup, if you want to lose your liver pretty fast, gain some weight, get a lot of diabetes, you could fall for the propaganda videos of just being another corn sugar, or you could actually listen to data and studies. We're not saying don't eat sugar and don't eat sweets. We're just saying eat those sugar and sweets like your grandma or grandparents used to make. High fructose corn syrup is the bane of modern society and is one of the reasons why we need universal health care. Which comes to the next point. We look at Americans as far as our average health in correlation to prescription drugs. And this study came out of the Mayo Clinic. 
Well, guess how many Americans are taking it up on any one point of time are on prescription drugs now. We're talking man, woman, and child. Well, that number is seven out of 10, which makes us pretty much a very, very, very codependent society. So, henceforth, the need for universal health care once again. Guess how many are on two prescription drugs at any one time? 50% of US citizens. Mm. And guess how many are on five prescription drugs at any one time or more? 20% of Americans. So you think about that, one out of five people are taking more than five prescription drugs at any one time. Probably because the high fructose corn syrup they're consuming, but beside that point, they're doing it which makes a very, very highly codependent society. There's got to be a better way. The thing that disturbed the research the most is the second most prescribed, and most Americans seem to be on, medication is antidepressants, which means there's a serious, serious mental health issue with the United States right now. And guess what came in a close third? Opiates. So we are drugged out, hallucinating, delusional society who's looking to escape from reality, which can explain a lot of the problems happening within society because it's beginning to disjoint our ability to rationalize logic properly. So you cannot uh, make judgment calls well when you have people which are taking medications which change their view of how reality actually is. All right, now after that, Seven out of 10 Americans, that bad news, and I apologize for pitting you over and over again with this segment with negatives, but you're not gonna hear from TV news, so someone's gotta say something. Mm -hmm. All right, after that, guess what? Antidepressants do. Well, a lot of people take antidepressants for post-traumatic stress syndrome. Yeah. That's a no-no. Why is that bad? Because an article published in Biological Psychiatry, again, not a no-name publication or some guy that's worshiping crystals from the planet of Venus. This published in the Biological Psychiatry. They discovered that generally, well, let's read you the title. It says, do antidepressants impair the ability to extinguish fear? Extinguish fear meaning getting rid of fear. And guess what? They do. Meaning, in layman's terms, if you have post-traumatic stress syndrome and you're taking an antidepressant, you get to live that fear over and over and over. Where your colleagues that may not be taking the antidepressants or, other or doing other type of medical interventions will eventually overcome their fears. So that antidepressants have a chance of keeping you in a constant state of terror as long as you're on them especially long-term. doesn't appear to be short-term, but long-term. Now let's go back to the study. <sighs> they don't understand exactly how these SSRIs affect memory and is poorly understood. As a follow-up, they have now tested the effects of antidepressants on extinction learning in animals using auditory fear conditioning, a model of fear learning that involves the amygdala. Oh, I can't pronounce it, amygdala. Dala. The amygdala is a region of the brain vitally important for processing memory and emotion. They found that long-term but not short-term SSI treatment impairs extinction learning, henceforth getting over fear, which the ability to learn that a conditioned stimulus no longer predicts an aversive effect. This impairment may have important consequences clinically since extinction-based exposure therapy is often used to treat anxiety disorders and antidepressants are often administered simultaneously, meaning that the antidepressants are going to impair the ability to get over your fears or over this extinction learning. The authors suggest for this effect of fear learning, they reported that the antidepressants decreased the level of the subunits of the NMDA receptors, NR2B, for those who want to get into the science of it, and the amygdala. The NMDA receptors are critically involved in the fear-related learning. Henceforth, you want to get, not get over your fears, you don't want to adapt to a stressor or post-traumatic stress as, as hard as it is. Take antidepressants and you'll be in fear as long as you're on them, most likely. Now, and I apologize again because you may want to wash your hands of that, but however though, antibacterial soaps. All right, 
Now, obviously, we know triclosan is known for basically causing muscle weakness and at the same time, too, causing cancer, prostate cancer, particularly in the whole lineup. And the antibacterial soaps work no better than regular soap that our grandparents used to use, but somehow we still like to take them because of government propaganda and TV propaganda working in conjunction with each other, not using science, but obviously using marketing. And again, henceforth, antidepressants, drugs, high fructose corn syrup are not based in science. They're based on merchandising. Mm -hmm. So to our next merchandised item, it's called triclosan or otherwise known as triclocarbion. It may harm nursing babies. Mm -hmm. And not only it harm them, the UT study, which said basically, it may reduce the survival rates. All right, this is what they had. This came out of Knoxville. They said, and also, sorry, this was printed in the Endocrine Society's 95th Annual Meeting and Expo in San Francisco. Kennedy was the study's lead author. Again, not a know-nothing organization. These are the doctors and medical researchers. They're trying to warn you, but they can't get past the merchandising. And a lot of doctors, unfortunately, do not read or keep up to date in things outside of what the drug companies teach them. Sounds cliche-ish, but unfortunately, that all the data points out that it's true. Otherwise, you wouldn't be taking half the stuff. The researchers know they were not condemning the use of antibacterial soaps. So whatever that means, go for it. People have to weigh their own risk and decide what would be the best route. They conducted an early study with uh, triclosan or tri uh, antibacterial soaps affect the growth of sex uh, hormones in adult male rats. Can you decide to go a step further and look how it would affect baby rats in the womb during nursing? And they use as much soap or antitriclosan you'd be exposed to just by doing a 15 minute shower. Even though the mothers may have had it in their system prior to birth, it did not affect the baby that was born. But if that mother was nursing and using antibacterial soap, mm. the average pups or the animals born to mice, guess how long they lived before they died. Average life expectancy was just six days. Just six days. And guess what? Your sewage system, water sewer treatment, water treatment system, only removes 95%, which may sound like a high number, but when you consider the amount of antibacterial soap being used or antibacterial chemicals being used in toothpaste, chemicals, food, everything, you can't escape it. You need to ban it. Well, that's it. My time is up, and thank you for that. Thank you very much. Once again, do your research and you can also catch our show on youtube.com forward slash VH film. Thank you very much.